you're me, Louis T. Welcome to the Draft Prospects 101 series. Your guide to some of the biggest, and hottest names. The 2024 NFL Draft. We're talking quarterbacks, and we've gone through some of the bigger names in the 2024 draft class of quarterbacks: Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels. But they may not be the only first-round quarterbacks this year, and we'll see. The draft is so you know funny every year. We start with X amount of quarterbacks that we think are going in the first round. We end up with a different number, um, whether th that number goes up. Everybody's a first round pick until they're not, right? So five is a number that we've seen multiple times in the draft. We've never seen more than five first round quarterbacks at a time. I think the last time we saw five was 2021. I think that was Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, um, Trey Lance, Mac Jones, and Justin Fields. So it's happened uh, on a number of occasions. I think you go back to 2018, and there was another draft with five quarterbacks. That one was Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, Josh Rosen, and Lamar Jackson. So five isn't a crazy number, and this is a very quarterback-needy draft in terms of teams needing a quarterback now. Another wrinkle to throw in is Justin Fields and what will happen with him in Chicago and whether he's traded or not. Um, that could take a team that needs a quarterback off the board potentially, but that's still going to leave the number at about seven or eight teams that are still looking for a starting caliber quarterback or at least an upgrade over the guy that they currently have. And so um, you could see four or even five guys go in the first round. And a name that is starting to sneak up into the consciousness of a lot of people. And, you know, we hear this often, you know, the media and, you know, people like myself and others, we start to begin the echo chamber, right? We start saying all the quarterbacks names that we think are going to go off the board early. And we haven't had the coaches and, and the people that really matter get to the tape yet. They're just starting that process now. And so once those people get involved, that's when you start to hear the narrative change on where these quarterbacks lie, right? So with that said, I think a guy that could see his stock potentially rise after coaches start to watch his tape more is that of J.J. McCarthy, junior Michigan Wolverine quarterback who just won a national championship. Record-wise, one of the greatest college football careers we've ever seen. 27-1 and one as a starter. Only one loss to his name. Only two guys in college football history have a better win percentage. And, of course, they didn't lose a game in their entire collegiate careers. So uh, what, he went, what he was able to do, nothing short of, of miraculous, and he brought a championship back to Michigan to Ann Arbor, where it hadn't been since the 90s. So he leaves Michigan well-decorated, but is it enough for him to hear his name called in round one of the 2024 NFL Draft? Don't know. Only time will tell. But let's talk about what could be some of the reasons that he does or does not hear his name called. In round one, let's talk about J.J. McCarthy, what he brings to the table, strengths, weaknesses, and who I think his NFL comps potentially could be. So let's take a look at J.J. McCarthy. And so we start with his size. He's 6'3", 205 pounds. And, and we'll find out if that 6'3", holds up. The 205 is interesting. He's a, he's a pretty skinny guy, right? So that 205 is something that he may need to improve upon. And we'll see, you know, we see it quite often. Guys, you know, start working out for the combine and then they get there and, and they did their pro days and whatnot. And, and then all of a sudden he's 212 pounds. So it, it, we'll see what happens, but um, he played his collegiate career at roughly 200 pounds. So this is a guy that I really like the fact that he left college playing his best football of his career. Um, the numbers bear that out. Uh, did not start as a freshman, but played in 11 games as a freshman, but got the nod in 2022. 
Um, did not start the first game of the season. Then started the uh, remaining 13. And led Michigan to a 12-1 and record. Obviously, the one loss coming to TCU in the semifinal playoff game in the Fiesta Bowl in 2022. Um, but in 2022, 14 games, 13 as a starter, 322 attempts, 208 completions, 64.6% completion percentage, um, 2,700 yards, uh, roughly 2719 to be exact, 8.4 yards per attempt, 22 touchdowns, five interceptions, which is the theme for him. He's a guy that takes care of the football. Um, that disappointing loss left a bad taste in everybody's mouth. Um, so they came back on a mission the following year. You could tell there was a lot of controversy surrounding that Michigan program, and it didn't phase them. They continued to play excellent football, and uh, McCarthy was one of the calming influences of that football team. Uh, 15 starts in 2023, 332 attempts, 240 completions uh, for a 72.3% completion percentage, obviously up by 8%. And um, his highest of his career. So you love to see that, right? Most attempts in his career in uh, 2023. Most completions of his career. Best completion percentage. Most yards, 2,991. So almost 3,000 yards passing. Um, Nine yards per attempt. So all career highs across the board. 22 touchdowns matched the 22 from the year previous in 2022. And uh, four interceptions. So he lessened that number despite having more attempts um, and and playing an extra game. So, again, takes care of the football, led Michigan on an undefeated national championship season 15 and 0. And so uh, a record of 27 and 1 as a starter. Rushing, he's not uh, necessarily a rusher. It's not the first thing you think of when you think of J.J. McCarthy, but he's fully functional as an athlete, can get to wherever he needs to on the field and can extend plays with his legs. And if you fall asleep behind the wheel, he can pick up yards with his legs. Uh, 15, um, or excuse me, in 14 games uh, in 2022, 70 attempts, 306 yards, five touchdowns, five fumbles, didn't lose any of them, okay? In 2023, this past year, 15 games, 64 attempts. So less attempts, less yards, 202, three touchdowns, All right, three fumbles did not lose any of them. So, again, um, a guy that really just takes care of the football, can utilize his legs, especially in the red zone, but uh, not afraid to have him, you know, tote the rock on a fourth down or in a critical situation. Uh, And he usually comes through, right, finds a way to get it where it needs to go. And so um, let's go ahead and start diving into what he brings to the table from a strengths perspective in his pros. So, The first pro is quality NFL height. Um, When you look at J.J. McCarthy, um, 6'3", that's what you're looking for, right? That's right around the, I'd say, the midpoint. 6'4", 6'5", is ideal. 6'2", okay, we can deal with it. 6'1", eh, you're a little on the short side. 6'3", is right in the middle, right? That's right where you're, you know, right in the middle. You're fine, right? Quality NFL height. Uh, Solid arm talent. So no one will ever confuse J.J. McCarthy with having a high-level NFL arm, right? That's not something that uh, you'll hear people talk about with J.J. McCarthy, but it's good enough. And as I've always said, a lot of the passers that we've seen be some of the best in the NFL over the years didn't have the strongest arm. your, Your arm strength doesn't determine how good you can be if you find ways to offset the fact that your arm isn't as strong as some of the other guys in the league, you just got to figure out how to make it work for you. And um, In college, he got away with a lot of things that I don't think he'll be able to get away with at the next level. And he'll have to tighten some of that stuff up, but his arm talent is good enough to get the football where it needs to go. And I, I saw him throw it 50, 55 yards on tape with, with ease. It didn't look like he put every single ounce of arm strength he had into these throws to get it to go 50, 55 yards. So he's got solid arm talent. Uh, above average athlete. I think he doesn't get enough credit for being a really good athlete um, for the position. And I, I think he's a guy that can extend plays. Will he be able to outrun athletic defenders at the next level? No. 
No, that's not who he is, right? But you get, um, you know, a defensive end that's in a base 3-4 in an odd front who's 295 pounds. He's outrunning that guy to the edge. You know, you get a 280-pound defensive end who's not as fleet of foot. He's outrunning that guy. Now, the, the big, fast, athletic guys, they're probably going to force him out of bounds or force him to bow backwards and, and have to find a receiver or throw it away. But when things break down, he can also use his legs. And we saw that quite a bit. They used him as a runner at Michigan, and he was quite successful in doing that as well. Uh, can extend plays both to run and to throw. So that's something that I think he does um, at a pretty good clip. Right. He does a really good job of extending plays as a runner or as a passer looking to keep any. And a lot of times he, he's looking to keep his eyes down the field to throw the football. Running is his last resort. That's not something that he's looking to do, but um, he can if need be. So um, he can extend plays. And in, in today's day and age, you better be able to extend plays. That, that's almost a prerequisite for the job title of starting quarterback in the NFL. Highly effective with a clean pocket. I, I, I know that doesn't sound like much and you say, duh, but not every quarterback is highly effective from the pocket, whether it's clean or dirty. Not everybody is efficient from a, a clean pocket necessarily. I mean, that's, that's troublesome if you're not, but he's at his best, his very best. When the pocket is clean, he's able to survey the field. And, you know, not uncommon to, you know, quarterbacks coming out of college. He's highly effective with a clean pocket when his first read wins. But not always is that the case. Long as the pocket's clean and he really was able to stand back there from a relatively clean pocket for most of the season because Michigan ran it a ton and their offensive line was pretty solid. So, um, it wasn't often that he had to run for his life like some of the other quarterbacks, but um, it's good to know that if he does get the proper protection, he can put the ball where it needs to go or at least make the right decision. Next pro. And I know this is going to sound bad. It doesn't sound like it's a pro. It sounds like it should be a con, but it's highlighted in red. And I think this is one of his superpowers. Game manager schizophrenia. So you're like, wait a minute. When when is being a schizo a positive? <laughs> Let me explain, okay? So JJ McCarthy is the quintessential NFL game manager. But he's a game manager on steroids. And I love game managers who at times forget that they're game managers. And that's JJ McCarthy. Like the traditional Alex Smith, those guys lack the attack gene. They're always playing from a defensive posture, meaning they're not looking for the big play. Instead of them looking deep and then coming back short, they're looking short. And then if that's not open, then they check deep, right? But in order to have an aggressive mindset and make big plays, you got to first start with having the mindset of wanting to attack deep. And J.J. McCarthy is one of those dudes that, for the most part, he's going to play it safe. Um, they're going to dial it back. They're not going to ask him to do too much. We'll talk about that. But there are times where he forgets he's a game manager and he makes a baller throw and you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, J.J. You can do that? He's like, you're damn right I can. And he's like, do it again. And then he's like, nah, I'm not doing it. But I just wanted you to know that I can do it. And so while he's a game manager and that that does exist and he is a game manager, there are baller throws in there where you go, whoa, JJ, <laughs> wait a minute. What's that? Is that in the repertoire? He's like, yeah, I can do that sometimes. Don't look for it all the time, but I can do that sometimes. And so I think when you're a game manager, but you forget that you're a game manager sometimes, it allows you to be a, an a, aggressive, in aggressive attack mode sometimes. And you get that from J.J. McCarthy. So in this particular case, being a game manager with schizophrenia um, is actually a positive, not a negative. Uh, he's a guy that forgets that he's a game manager sometimes and he'll make a baller throw. 
tight window, thread the needle, and you go, wait a minute. You're not supposed to be doing that. Your job description, your, your title is of a game manager. Game managers don't do that. Uh, next pro, keeps turnovers to a minimum. Uh, that, like, like I said, when you're a game manager, that's what you do best. I've, I've talked about this. Man has 11 career interceptions, one lost fumble in his career. So you're talking about 12 turnovers in two years of work and really three if you go back to the um, his freshman year where he didn't start any games, but he played in 11 games. So this guy, just he just doesn't turn it over a, a bunch. 49 touchdown passes, um, another 10 touchdown rushes. So 59 total touchdowns and only 12 in, uh, turnovers for his career. So he just, he just, he doesn't turn it over. He doesn't put you in bad spots. Um, that could change at the next level, uh, but we will see. Um, growth and maturation. I talked about this over the life of his career. You saw him continue to grow from his freshman year where he didn't start to his sophomore year where he started 13 games, went 12 and one, led him to the playoffs. Uh, and then to this final year in 2023 as a junior, where he goes out, goes undefeated 15-0, and leads them to a national championship, career highs across the board except for touchdown passes, which was the exact same number that he had the year prior. So you saw the growth, you saw the maturation. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting about J.J. McCarthy is, is the ceiling a little bit higher because he wasn't asked to do as much at Michigan. Just because he wasn't asked to do it doesn't mean he's not capable of doing it. It just means they didn't ask him to do it. You see it all the time in the NBA, right? You see, especially the guys that used to come from Kentucky, where they played in a system that didn't allow them to necessarily show off all of their traits and their entire skill set, right? Devin Booker, we didn't know he could dribble when he was at Kentucky because he never did. You know, you know the brow, right? Anthony Davis. We didn't know Anthony Davis was this complete player that could dribble, shoot, take you off the dribble, take you out to the perimeter, back to the basket, Everything. He, he had a complete, you didn't see that at Kentucky, right? So just because you didn't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Just means we didn't see it. We weren't exposed to it. Um, I think we know what J.J. McCarthy is, but there could be more. We'll see. And lastly, and this is another superpower. He's a winner. All he knows is winning. Um, only lost two games in college. I think he was something like 37 and two in college or excuse me, high school, you know, something along those lines, only two losses in high school, only one loss in college, 27 and one, uh, three losses between high school and college. Like all the dude knows is winning. Won a national championship. That's a hell of a trait to have. That's one you would prefer your guy to have. And he has that. So we go from his pros to his cons. So, Ball placement consistency is something that showed up on tape for me way too many times. And even though the 72.3% completion percentage says, hey, he's not missing a lot, the, the tape says otherwise. A lot of back shoulders, a lot of guys having to adjust, not getting the yards after the catch. Um, he threw a pick six in the playoff game. He threw two pick sixes, as a matter of fact. But the first one is a ball that I see him throw too often and it's going to be way more trouble for him at the next level if he continues to do this. A lot of outbreaking routes with the ball on the inside hip. That can't happen. And that's how that pick six happened against TCU. And he got lucky that he didn't throw two or three more of those. I, I can tell you right now, I watched J.J. McCarthy in five games. I can tell you right now in those five games, I saw at least at least seven to eight balls that were in pretty poor spots that could have easily been picked off uh, or could have had some really, really treacherous results um, at the next level with better um, athleticism, speed, awareness, et cetera, et cetera. So um, he's going to have to get better with the ball placement. Guys are having to, you know, leave and leap up outside of their frame to go get the football. He's going to have to clean some of that shit up. Um, next con can get stuck on his first read. That's not uncommon for collegiate quarterbacks who often see open receivers um, in their first and second reads. Uh, you stick to those guys because they win for you a lot of times. You want to allow plays to develop. Uh, but there are times where he gets stuck on that first read. There's a really bad sack he takes against Michigan State where his first read was actually open, right? 
and he didn't cut it loose for some reason. And we'll talk about that um, a little bit later on. As a matter of fact, delayed decision making is the next con. So I'll just leap the uh, l- lump the two together. Um, that Michigan State um, play that I'm referencing, he's got uh, his uh, number one read on that play running a corner route to the end zone. He's got it. Just cut it loose, dude. And he, when you're when you're a game manager, you have to see it to cut it loose. Like generally you're not going to just trust that this guy is going to be at a spot when he's supposed to be there and cut it loose, which is what you have to do at the NFL level. You know, there are a lot of offenses where it's predicated on you just throwing to a spot. That guy will get there. You trust that he's going to run his route at the right depth. The, the coverage is there. You see what you need to see, put it in that window and that guy will be there. JJ McCarthy's not doing that right now. A lot of times he needs to see that guy win or at least be even with the defender to cut it loose. And um, sometimes it he holds on to it just a tick longer than he needs to, right? Makes the throw a lot tougher than it should be. If he just anticipates a little bit more, um, he'll have a better shot of, of putting that ball in a more accurate position where his guy can make a play after the catch instead of having to turn and adjust or now the window is tighter because you waited a second longer. So um, I think he has delayed decision-making sometimes because he doesn't always trust what he sees and he doesn't want to make a mistake. And he can get stuck on that first read, which, you know, you see that a lot of times with these uh, quarterbacks coming out of the collegiate ranks. So you see this highlighted in red. This is, to me, his biggest deficiency at the current moment. And again, this could end up being something that isn't an issue down the road and and he could prove a lot of people myself included who think he's a game manager and nothing more than that he could prove us wrong right and i talked about this just five minutes ago but we'll reiterate here hasn't proven that he can shoulder the burden if necessary so his career high in attempts in a game is 37 i mean when you're talking about some of these quarterbacks in this draft class and really any draft class, when we're talking about you being a first round pick, there's a game in there where you were trailing or it was a shootout and they just said, Hey, we need you. And you let it rip 40, 45, 47, 54 times in that game. Cause you had to, and it doesn't always equate to a win, but you gave your team a fighting chance. Cause you're not always going to be playing with the lead. You know, J.J. McCarthy was in a very advantageous situation at Michigan because often he was playing in a position of power. He was playing from a lead out in front. You know, Michigan rarely trailed in games. That defense was so good, specifically in 2023. It was so good. They had the best scoring defense in the nation. So they weren't giving up a ton of points. So they didn't have to rely on J.J. McCarthy. So it's not that he can't. He may not be able to, but we can't definitively say he can't. We just haven't seen it. And I talked about that, you know, using the basketball analogy with the Kentucky Wildcats and and the system that they ran under John Calipari and how you didn't often see what guys could actually do because they were running a system and they played within the system and they didn't really veer outside of that so you could see some of the things that they could also do. McCarthy played in that system. They asked him to be a manager of the game, to not turn it over, to make plays when your number's called, make the throw, make the run on third down, um, move the offense efficiently. That's what they asked him to do. But the thing that I struggle with with him is when the game was its biggest, they dialed him back. They didn't ask and require more of him. In that game, I thought their toughest opponent was going to be Penn State because to me, Penn State was one of the better defenses in college football this year. And in a game that was cold, dreary, your head coach isn't there, they ran it 32 times in a row. He threw eight passes against Penn State. Let me repeat myself. He threw eight passes against the Penn State Nittany Lions in a game. Not a practice, not a practice, but a real game. Eight attempts, seven of eight for 60 yards. He didn't get hurt. And I'm not saying that they didn't trust him, but what does that say to you? In a game against Ohio State, where you would think they would lean on him, and look, there were a lot of big plays that he made in that game. Not a lot of attempts, though. 
national championship game. He was a passenger. He made a couple of plays here and there. One big play with his legs when they were backed up. One or two throws when they had to have it. But he didn't do much, and they didn't ask him to do much. I don't know if you're down 17, if J.J. McCarthy can bring you back. Right now, it doesn't feel like he can. But we'll see. I think right now, that's the biggest deficiency, and that's why I don't think people see him as a high-level quarterback in this year's draft class, but he could be the answer for a number of teams that need a guy. He could be that guy for you. Last con is he throws a flat second and third level ball. To me, he doesn't put enough air on a lot of these deep balls. A lot of these balls are flat. You go back to 2022 and you're watching some of the deep balls he threw against TCU and against Ohio State. There's not a lot of trajectory on these these balls. Now they got there, right? But they, they could have been so much more. And especially in that TCU game where they fell short a couple of times in the end zone and didn't get in, you're talking about the difference between winning that game and losing it and, and just putting a little bit more air and allowing Roman Wilson to run under the ball instead of falling down short at the one-yard line, right? Like, everything to me is on a line. And I've seen passes of his get deflected where if he just puts air on it and has a little bit of touch, it'll go, get over that first defender. Um, Everything that he throws to me on the second and third level is flat. Could use a little bit more air, which means he needs to, to time it up a little bit better. Anytime you throw something flat, it means you might have gotten there just a smidge too late. Now you got to drill it in there and get it there faster. You anticipate better, which is what I talked about earlier, de- delayed decision making. If you anticipate a little bit better, then you don't have to throw it on a rope. You can then put air under it and allow your guy to run under it. He doesn't do that enough for me. So what do I see him as at the next level? Who is a high-level comp for J.J. McCarthy? At his best, he's Andy Dalton. Second-round pick out of TCU, a guy that had a very similar track record coming into the NFL. He had a 12-1 and season at TCU. His final year at TCU, 13-0. and Unfortunately, they didn't have the playoffs back in those days, so he didn't get a shot. But he went undefeated in his last season. In his last two years, Andy Dalton 25-1 and one in college football. So I see a lot of similarities from an arm talent perspective, um, from a, a, an ability to run an NFL offense. And remember, Andy Dalton, you hear Andy Dalton name and you think, oh, okay. Andy Dalton went to the playoffs, winning seasons, first five years of his career. Okay? Andy Dalton. Winning records the first five years of his career went to the playoffs the first four years of his career. So, uh, Andy Dalton was really good, you know, and he's got a winning record overall in his NFL career. More touchdowns and interceptions. I get that's not the that's not the the measure for a good quarterback, but if JJ McCarthy turns into Andy Dalton, you got a chance to win and win big in this league. Now, if he doesn't turn into Andy Dalton, he, on the low-level side of his skill set, turns into Mitchell Trubisky. And again, Mitchell Trubisky has made the playoffs twice in his career. He's got more wins than losses as a starter in his NFL career. He um, has more touchdowns and interceptions. Again, that's not the uh, way that we measure quarterbacks in this league. I think most people would look at Mitchell Trubisky as the number former number two overall pick and would label him as a bust. That's accurate at this point of his career, but doesn't mean he hasn't had a good career. It just means he hasn't lived up to the expect. Had Mitchell Trubisky been drafted in the second round, I think we'd look at his career much differently. The fact that he was drafted number two overall, we view him from that prism and he doesn't measure up to what a number two overall pick is supposed to look like. But had he gone, much like Andy Dalton did, 35th in the second round overall, We'd look at Mitchell Trubisky as a success. We'd look at him like we look at Derek Carr. None of those guys have won big, but we see them different. If Derek Carr was drafted seventh overall, he'd be a bust right now. But Derek Carr was drafted in the second round where he belonged. Andy Dalton was drafted in the second round where he belongs. And we view their careers differently. J.J. McCarthy, to me, is a second round pick. Unfortunately, somebody is probably going to take him 
because of a lack of resources, right? This is a supply and demand issue in the NFL. Someone's going to take J.J. McCarthy higher than he probably should go. Now, he's a winner. That helps. But you know who else was a winner? Desmond Ritter was a winner. And he went 43-6 and six in his collegiate career and, and didn't have a home loss his entire college career. Going back to high school, he hadn't lost a home game. What does that matter? Winning is good. You want your guy to be a winner. You'd much rather have a quarterback that's a winner than a loser. But can you play or not? At this level. We'll find out. We'll see if somebody reaches for J.J. McCarthy. I think if you spend a first round pick on J.J. McCarthy. You might not be overwhelmed by what you get. You spend a second round pick on him. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. With what you've just drafted yourself. We'll see what happens. But that's J.J. McCarthy. And his draft prospects 101 breakdown. I've got more. So stay tuned. We'll be back to break down more quarterbacks, more players at various positions as we head towards the 2024 NFL Draft. Until then, I'm your man, Louis T, signing off. Until next time, you guys, have a good one. Take care. Mm-hmm.